Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the Managing Editor of Infection Control Today. We're helping infection preventionists and other healthcare workers fighting COVID-19. And one of the ways we're doing that is touching base with experts. With me today is Dr. Lisa Brosseau, and she is a nationally recognized expert on respiratory protection and infectious diseases. She taught at the University of Illinois Chicago for many years. She's retired from teaching, but not retired from giving her opinion, even when it means going against the grain. Dr. Brousseau recently co-wrote an opinion piece that stirred a bit of controversy. Why? Well, here's the title, Mass for All, COVID-19, Not Based on Sound Data. In it, Dr. Brousseau argues, um, well, I'll let you sum it up from here, doctor. What's the gist of the opinion piece? So the article started out with the goal of trying to, um, trying to look at the literature related to cloth masks in healthcare. Mm. And when I when and then it got expanded way beyond that to cloth masks and surgical masks and respirators, and for healthcare and for the community. So um, it was a much more comprehensive than I expected it to be. It took me a little longer to write, but at the end of the day, um, I came. I I was looking at cloth masks and surgical masks and respirators from several points of view. First of all, for healthcare and, and community, but also, do they work as source control or do they work as personal protective equipment or both? And at the end of the day, cloth masks, in my opinion, don't work in any form. They aren't, aren't very good at source control, except for maybe very large particles. And they're not very, not, they should not be used in healthcare settings uh, for a number of reasons. Surgical masks, I decided, uh, based on the literature, might have a role as source control uh, for people who have symptoms, say if they're staying home and they have some symptoms. They shouldn't be something you'd wear if you have symptoms going out into the public because you shouldn't be going out into public with a surgical mask or with symptoms. But it's a good, poss- it's a good um, option for, for patients to wear in healthcare settings where they, especially for those who are experiencing symptoms, to what I would call diminish the viral load, basically decrease the amount of particles, um, infectious particles in the, in the air in a healthcare setting. Um, so at the end of the day, the only thing that provides personal protective equipment is, as, or personal protection for the person wearing the mask is a respirator. Um, and the, that is the thing that healthcare workers should be wearing, particularly if we're worried about the small aerosols, small particles that people will generate uh, when they're infectious. And in fact, people generate particles whether they're infectious or not, but particularly when they're infected and infectious, that will um, you know, be present in the vicinity, the vicinity of, a health, of a patient that the best protection in that case is for the healthcare worker to wear a respirator. And I got asked a little bit to think about respirators for the community. You know, if we had a lot of respirators, that might be a good idea, but we don't have very many of them. And so for the purposes of saving saving respirators for the people who really need them, I recommended that we not, that the public not be wearing respirators and not be buying respirators and if they had them, please donate them even to healthcare workers. So I hope that's a good summary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good, very good st- summary. And you did a, 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 a deep dive into the literature. And I saw you had many, many references. So the mystery to me is why did the CDC say to people, go ahead out and you know, wear a cloth mask if you want to say, so, you know, hazard yeah. guess of what's going on with that? You know what's interesting to me is if you look at the references that are sh- that, that were listed on, under their recommendation, um, they're all none of them have anything to do with masks or the performance of masks or the performance of their filters or any of that. They're all references related to asymptomatic tra- sim- pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic transmission. Um, I don't get, I didn't get the message there entirely, but I did, what I was glad to see is that they recognize that asymptomatic and presymptomatic transmission are happening. 
Um, my message would have been, if those were the references I was looking at, is maybe we should actually be encouraging people to stay home more. My, my biggest problem with wearing, telling people they can wear masks is it gives you this false sense of security and it might even encourage you to think that now you're, protect, you're protected and you're protecting people around you. And I see many more people. I mean, my husband and I try to take a walk every afternoon just to get out, get a little bit of, um, ex, you know, get a little fresh air and exercise. And I'm seeing more and more people now wearing cloth masks uh, on the streets. And I don't go to stores anymore, but my understanding is they're wearing them there as well. I don't have a problem with people wearing them. I just want them to understand that they aren't very much more protective than if they weren't wearing them. And they're really not doing a whole lot of good for the people around them. So we should continue to do social distancing as much as we possibly can. You know, right? I have places that are saying that you actually have to wear them. You know, um, New York, where you're supposed to wear them anytime you're in contact with people. I don't know. I mean, I just think it's, it's um, not recognizing that the mode of transmission for this organism is likely small aerosols and close range. And wearing a cloth mask doesn't, shouldn't give you any feeling of safety for being close to people. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't make you feel that you're not, being, not generating small particles because you still are. And you, since we none of us know if we're infected or infectious, many of us are, are probably are and aren't going to have symptoms because we know that that's the case for at least some fraction of the population, that we're putting everyone around us at risk. And especially the people I most care about are the workers. Mm -hmm. Our essential workers are really key to our success in, in flattening the curve. And they're the ones who make it possible for us to stay home and be isolated, those of us who are privileged enough to have that opportunity. But we go out and think that we are doing something good for the public and, and their workers, and we're actually not. I think we put them at more risk. So I don't, I just, I don't understand the CDC's recommendations for this. My guess is that there's a lot of political pressure and no, no government agency can, is entirely, you know, um, immune from political pressure. Mm -hmm. There's pressure to open, right? right? There's pressure to start restart the economy. I understand that entirely. And so I think the feeling was probably if we give everybody a mask, we can just reopen and everything's gonna be fine. I think we're gonna be shocked to find that that's not going to work. And I mean, I, I won't be shocked, but there will be lots of people who we, will be shocked. And in fact, I, I read an article recently about a funeral. They were, they were, a number of people attended the funeral. They were all wearing masks. They were taking photos next to each other. They were talking and a number of people got infected. So it's very clear. These things do no good. <laughs> yeah. um, you've gotten a lot of notice, obviously, for your, for your article. Have you gotten uh, much feedback from healthcare workers or healthcare experts themselves? I mean, feedback is as much as like they don't agree with you, or, or, or oh yeah, really? there are there are a number who don't who don't agree, but there are a lot of people who didn't agree with my first article about aerosol transmission either. So um, that's you know, I'm sort of used to it. The, the key is you have to just, you know, the important thing is to say, here's what the science tells us. Mm -hmm. um, you, it, it, and I, I often, my conversations with people these days, I often point out that what we're seeing is a lot of magical thinking, a lot of wishful thinking. Cloth masks are wishful thinking. We wished that they, and, and people saying, well, they work in Asia. There's no evidence that they work in Asia. In fact, it's very clear that the healthcare workers in China, um, they may have been wearing cloth masks to start with, but when you look at pictures of what they were wearing later, they were wearing respirators. They were wearing full face gear and, and body gear and gloves. And so it, it was clear that, that even surgical masks weren't working in healthcare settings for controlling COVID-19. I, I, I don't understand. The Asian countries wear masks for, societal and cultural reasons, not because they actually think they're protecting, there's going to be a whole lot of protection. I'm not, so. I'm not an expert in um, epidemiology, so I will leave the modeling to, the, to those who know more about how this is going to work, but I do know my history, 
and my history, if, re if you read about 1918 um, influenza and the pandemic, it took almost two years for that to be completely you know, done with. They did a lot of similar things. They closed down, they opened again, and then they had to close down and then they had to open again. Now, granted, they didn't have a lot of what we have today, but in some ways we're not all that different from 1918. We don't have any testing. We don't have any contact tracing. They didn't either. <laughs> they didn't even really know about that. They didn't know much about viruses. So we have huge amounts of scientific information, but we have almost no infrastructure anymore in public health. And so if without our infrastructure in public health and our resources to do contact tracing and testing, and testing I mean with tests that really work, that are both highly specific and, and highly sensitive, and we don't have any of those yet. Um, in many ways, we're making, we're being forced to make many of the same decisions that were made during the 1918 influenza pandemic, and the results are going to be similar. We are trying to decide when to open it back up. No one really knows the, the perfect answer to that. The models, you know, they're, they're not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So but, I know COVID infection preventionists are often they're often pulled in two directions. One is they have to worry about patients. The other is they have to worry about workers. And sometimes the things you do for patients don't work for workers and sometimes the other way around, right? right. So that's right. why I recommend including your health and safety people, industrial hygienists and others, because they can give you that perspective about workers that will help you make good decisions for both. And really it should be a hand in hand decision making that goes on. Okay, we still um, call it uh, mass for the public. Any final words about that? Or? Yes, boy, I would really strongly encourage hospitals to stop asking people to send them the cloth masks and instead ask for respirators. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily discourage the public from wearing them if it makes them feel comfortable, but I hope they don't think that they're protecting themselves. Dr. Lisa Rousseau, thank you for being with Infection Control today, today. and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you, and you too.